Stephen Christoforou is the director of the Department of Youth and Young Adult Ministries of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. He is a graduate of Yale University, Fordham University School of Law, and Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Steve is passionate about sharing the gospel in a clear and accessible way and helping people see Christ at work in their lives. He will be speaking on rites of passage. Please welcome Steve Christopher. It's good to be with you all. Think back to the moment you entered the Orthodox Church, to the moment you became an Orthodox Christian. If you're anything like me, you can't. I was baptized as an infant. I have absolutely no memory of my baptism and chrismation. I have absolutely no memory of the first time I received Holy Communion. I have no memory of what it was like to not be a Christian and what it was like to receive that incredible, undeserved, indescribable gift. And that's weird because I can rattle off a long list of other firsts that I can recall. The first time I attended a hockey game, the first time I rode the subway by myself, the first time I drove a car, the first time I received a paycheck. My life is marked by a long string of firsts, a long string of life milestones that chart my path from childhood to adulthood. And yet, I can't recall the day I became a Christian, the day I became truly alive in Christ. Cultures around the world have designed rites of passage to mark the passage of time and the development of young people as they mature into adults. While baptism and chrismation are a sort of rite of passage, most young people experience those as infants. And this relative lack, this relative lack of rites of passage for us in the church is worth considering. Because what kind of effect does this lack of rites of passage have on young people? And how can the church turn into a, turn to a lived and embodied theology of practice to explore what this may look like for young people today? But before we go any further, I should acknowledge something. This question may not be on anybody's radar, like at all. I mean, who cares if the church doesn't have a robust and embodied theology of practice that walks young people through their various life experiences and helps raise them into mature and faithful adults? Isn't it our job to simply make sure that young people learn all the orthodox perspectives they need to learn, to stuff their heads with the right ideas before they go off to college where secular institutions will inevitably seek to corrupt them? I mean, that's certainly how I was raised. I spent years listening to Sunday school lessons and youth group speeches. I spent years listening to talks and lectures and even diatribes from a long list of clergy and lay ministry workers. And you know what I didn't grow up doing? Doing. I mean, I didn't grow up learning to live as an Orthodox Christian by actually living as an Orthodox Christian. I'll give you a couple of simple examples of this. When I was a kid, I was in Sunday school, and, and at the end of yet another year of listening to lessons on a whole host of subjects, we had our traditional end of year ceremony. All the kids got a little prayer rope. You know what I'm talking about, that simple little loop of knotted wool that can fit in your pocket. Well, as the teacher placed the object in my hand, I remember being dumbfounded. What is this? What do I do with it? I looked up at the teacher, more than a little perplexed, and she looked down at me and nudged me along because there was a whole line of kids standing behind me who also needed to get their prayer rope. I never did learn what that little bit of knotted wool was or what to do with it. So it spent some time on my wrist, a sort of orthodox bracelet because that's what I saw other people do with their prayer ropes. And then after a while, because I wasn't quite sure what the point of that bracelet was, I took it off and it ended up somewhere in my room lost to history. I heard a lot of things that year in Sunday school but I didn't learn much. I certainly didn't learn to pray, and when I received a tool to facilitate prayer, I had no idea what to do with it. Here's another story. When I was a kid, I was also involved in youth group, and, and at the end of another year of listening to lessons on a whole host of subjects, we had yet another traditional end of year ceremony. All the kids got a little prayer book. You know what I'm talking about, a little book full of all kinds of prayers that can fit in your pocket. Well as the youth group leader placed the object in my hand, I remember being dumbfounded. What is it? What do I do with it? I looked up at the youth group leader, more than a little perplexed, and he looked down at me and nudged me along because there was a whole line of kids standing behind me who also needed to get their little prayer book. I never did learn what to do with that book. 
So it spent some time on my bookshelf gathering dust, and eventually it disappeared into some box where it probably remains, lost to history. Now, think about those transformative, how transformative those moments could have been in my life. Think about what could have been if an, if an adult didn't simply hand me a prayer rope, but showed me how to use it. Think about what, what could have happened if an adult sat with me in a quiet church, taught me to calm my heart and clear my mind and recite the Jesus prayer over and over while my thumb steadily moved from knot to knot. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, the sinner. Think about what could have happened if, if an adult didn't simply hand me a prayer book but showed me how to use it. Think about what could have happened if an adult stood with me before an icon, opened the book to morning prayers, and calmly said, this is what you should read every morning when you wake up. Let's say the prayers together. I submit to you that the disembodied way we approach ministry leads to these fundamental gaps in the life of a young Orthodox Christian. I'm not going to explain to you why we got here, how it is that Orthodox Christians are still copying the ministry mistakes pioneered by American Protestants in the decades after World War II. That'll have to wait for another time. Because I'm here to talk about rites of initiation and how they relate to the lives of young Orthodox Christians today. I'm not sure it would be helpful or even possible for me to adequately describe the long history of rites of initiation that you'll find in different cultures throughout time and around the world. Nor am I equipped to offer some sort of high-level sociological or anthropological analysis of this history. Instead, I'd like this presentation to be grounded in the ministry of the church. And I'm hoping that I can offer you not historical facts or abstract observations, but a framework through which you can ask questions and begin to imagine how you might design your own rites of passage in the future. Because as I've observed, this does seem to be missing in the lives of most contemporary Orthodox Christians. And I hope that this conversation can frame rites of initiation in the larger context of effective Christian ministry. If we're wrestling with what rites of initiation might mean in the life of a contemporary Christian, it should be grounded in the way we approach basic questions of ministry. So I hope we can articulate a vision for ministry that includes not just words, but lived and embodied practices. Practices which include what we call rites of passage or rites of initiation. Because if we can do that, then we can do a better job actually meeting the needs of young people today. I'm going to start by sharing something that is at the core of effective Christian ministry, which is an online ministry training program that we developed a couple of years ago. It's the culmination of years of research and prayer and trial and error. I myself have been involved in ministry, not just as a participant, but as a leader since I was in high school. My home parish graduated us from Sunday school after ninth grade, because clearly there was nothing left to learn. So I started teaching Sunday school when I was a high school sophomore. I've been involved in ministry for over 20 years at this point. I had the incredible blessing to attend Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology as a seminarian, and effective Christian ministry is a really, I think, core articulation of everything that I've learned over the course of those years. And I hope it's helpful to give us a framework for today. I hope it's helpful to give us the foundation we need to lay in order to explore what is possible when it comes to designing rites of passage into the rhythms of our ministry work. So here they are, the five basic needs that the church needs to meet in the lives of young people. First, young people need to know, to actually know Jesus. Second, they need to know who they truly are. Third, they need to belong to the full community of the church. Fourth, they need to be empowered with a faith that makes a difference. And fifth, they need to be equipped with the teachings of the Orthodox faith. It's those three in the middle, needs two, three, and four, that are really going to connect with what we're talking about with rites of initiation, rites of passage. And the order of these needs is not accidental. Each, as we'll see, flows naturally into and out of the others. Consider that first need, to actually know Jesus. We may give this a lot of lip service in the church, but do we really start here? How many of the young people who pass through traditional church ministries actually emerge not simply knowing about Jesus, but actually knowing the Lord himself? Knowing Christ, actually knowing Christ. We seem to forget that Christianity is first and foremost about the person of Jesus Christ, the Alpha and Omega, as we read in the book of Revelation. This subtly comes across in the language we use. You're far more likely to hear people talk about the faith which is an abstract notion, than the person of Jesus Christ. 
you're far more likely to hear people talk about orthodoxy, which again is such an abstract and can be an ideological word than the body of Jesus Christ. Consider this from a different angle. When someone expresses interest in the church, what's the first thing we do? Do we offer to pray with them? Do we invite them to experience the kingdom made manifest in the liturgy? No, I think we're far more likely to recommend a book they should read. Think back to little Steve holding a prayer rope in his hands for the first time. This would have been the perfect opportunity to sit and pray together, to actually experience the person of Jesus Christ. But that opportunity was wasted, as it's wasted in the lives of so many young people. I, like many other kids who grew up in the church, didn't grow up knowing Christ. And that had consequences for the second need, to know who I truly am. All young people need to know who they truly are. Adolescence and young adulthood are times when we constantly try on new musical styles and new hobbies and most obviously new clothing styles. A kid can easily go from wearing baggy clothes and backwards baseball caps to tight jeans and black eyeliner overnight. A kid can seamlessly shift from hip hop to emo in a desperate attempt to find herself, putting on different styles until she finds something that fits. Add social media to the mix and you've got a stage on which you can parade whatever self you want to try on and see what kind of response it gets. When I was a kid, I at least got to go home after school. I had a safe place away from middle and high school social pressure. Today's young people are teenagers all the time. Today's young people are teenagers all the time. Life is a stage and that stage of life is a constant performance, a play lived out in real time on Instagram or TikTok or whatever your social media app of choice is. They're constantly trying on, constantly performing, constantly trying to find something that fits. And yet the church already offers us a garment, the white garment of baptism. Because as St. Paul observed, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And unlike other identities that young people try on, this doesn't need to be purchased or earned. Our identity in Christ is given to us. And what a gift that is. We Christians are able to hold in tension our own fallenness as the chief of sinners with the reality that God did not cease to do all things until he raised us up to heaven. This identity gives us a safe space in which we can be honest about our sins and mistakes and do the hard work of repentance. As forgiven sinners, we can look at all parts of ourselves, trusting that there is nothing in us that is somehow too bad for the grace of God. Think back to little Steve, holding a prayer rope in his hands for the first time. This would have been the perfect opportunity to understand myself in light of Christ, to borrow from the words of Jesus, to know both that I really am the chief among sinners, and yet that Christ really does have mercy on me, if I would only ask him to have mercy on me. But I, like so many other kids who grew up in the church, didn't grow up knowing who I truly am in relation to Christ. I grew up with a grunge phase and a whatever phase and this and that, like I think all of us probably did. And that had consequences for that third need, to belong to the full community of the church. All young people need to belong to the full community of the church. When St. Paul describes the church, he uses the image of a body, a thing with many different members. Certainly, it's something that is fundamentally coherent and united. One body, one church. Young people are constantly looking for a place where they can belong, a place where they can be accepted, a place where they can be safe. Yet we often tend to cordon young people off from the larger community of the church. We divide kids according to age, like schools do. We even pull them out of the liturgy sometimes to do their youth things. Like many kids, I grew up attending Sunday school, slipping into the liturgy right before the gospel, and then slipping out right after communion to continue the lesson. And then, when I was a young adult, I surprised people by running for a seat on the parish council. Yet it was immediately made clear that I was still just a kid and needed to sit quietly and vote as I was instructed. So I walked out of my first parish council meeting and I resigned a few months later. Oh, it was terrible. <laughs> Yet all Christians are equally members of the body. All Orthodox Christians have access to the same sacraments, the same experience of God's good gifts. There are no junior Christians, and yet that's not how the church tends to treat young people. The fact that we don't have a robust theology of rites of initi initiation, lived and embodied practices that help young people find their place in the church is evidence of this. 
And this is so tragic because youth and young adults are constantly looking for places of belonging, where they can be fully known and accepted. Yet this need tends to go unfulfilled in the church. So young people, desperate to have this need met, are driven right into the arms of some other organization. Because other organizations do a better job of welcoming young people. Other organizations do a better job of encouraging young people. But the church should be a place that doesn't simply want us when we're at our Sunday best, but is also ready to love us when we're at our worst. Think back to little Steve, holding a prayer rope in his hands for the first time. This would have been the perfect opportunity to see how I belong to the full community of the church, to pray the same words that even the greatest saints and ascetics utter in their monastic caves and cells, to be invited into the same spiritual struggle that every Christian is called to undertake, despite my youthful fidgetiness, or rather because of my youthful fidgetiness, to channel that energy towards communion with God, rather than allow it to dissipate as unfocused adolescent energy. But I, like so many other kids who grow up in the church, didn't grow up knowing that I belonged to the full community of the church. And that had consequences for the fourth need, to be empowered with a faith that makes a difference. All young people need to be empowered with a faith that makes a difference. All young people need to know that this community to which they belong actually matters in the world. That we don't simply talk about loving our neighbor, but actually take steps to love our neighbor. That people in the neighborhood would notice if our parish were to suddenly disappear because the absence of its love would be obvious. In his epistle, St. James reminds us that pure and undefiled religion is in fact caring for orphans and widows. This, of course, is not even to mention Christ's own words by which he identifies himself with the poor and needy, saying, inasmuch as you did or did not do for the least of these, my brethren, you did or did not do it for me. Living as a Christian does have consequences in the world, or at least it should. And young people notice when it doesn't. Think back to little Steve holding a prayer, in his, a prayer rope in his hands for the first time. This would have been the perfect opportunity to be empowered with a faith that can make a difference in the world, to see that we are called to pray with and for people at all times, to see that we are mindful of the needs of those people at all times, and to act accordingly. But I, like so many other kids who grew up in the church, didn't grow up being empowered with a faith that makes a difference, and that had consequences for that fifth need, to be equipped with the teachings of the Orthodox faith, which we sometimes place as our first priority when it comes to reaching young people. All young people need to be equipped with the teachings of the faith, but as you'll notice, this is the fifth need on our list. You may have heard business leaders repeatedly say that people need to start with why, to lead with vision before we get into the what or how. Well, you can understand the ordering of those needs in light of this observation. Young people won't care what the church teaches if they don't first know that it matters. And it's the culmination of a process that starts with our experience of the living Christ. We say many things about the Lord in our theology, that he is the philanthropos, right? The one who loves mankind, for example. But this word only makes sense if we have first experienced God's loves for us. Without that, the word is just empty, even meaningless. Think back to little Steve holding a prayer rope in his hands for the first time. This would have been the perfect opportunity to be equipped with the teachings of the Orthodox faith, to learn a little bit about prayer. And I'll be honest, it's entirely possible that someone did say something to me about what that prayer rope was. But as you can tell, it didn't register. It didn't stick because the groundwork hadn't been laid. There was nothing in my life that made me receptive to that knowledge. And so even if I received that knowledge, it went in one ear and out the other. So this, in a nutshell, is our foundation. And if you're interested in getting more into this greater depth, I encourage you to check out Effective Christian Ministry. But for our purposes, it's enough to observe that questions surrounding rites of passage touch on those second, third, and fourth needs that we've identified. The need for young people to know who they truly are, the need for young people to belong to the full community of the church, and the need for young people to be empowered with a faith that makes a difference. As our time together comes to a close, before I open up for questions as we get, begin to wrestle with this, I'd like to leave you with a few questions to guide your thinking when we break out into small groups after a Q&A, uh, to guide your thinking as you explore what kinds of rites of initiation or rites of passage you can design for your ministry 
and how these rites of initiation can meet these needs in the lives of young people in your care. So a couple of questions, which should be in your, in your booklet as well. First, what embodied practices and rituals can help a young person see herself as a forgiven sinner who is called to a life of holiness? Second, what embodied practices and rituals can help a young person see herself as unconditionally loved by the full community to which she belongs, whether it's a parish or some other collection of people? And third, what embodied practices and rituals can help a young person see that the life to which she is called as a Christian has concrete consequences in the wider world? So that's something to ground us as we break out into small groups. But first, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to chat, chat about those. Thank you. Hi. Could you share some of the rites of passage that you have used either in parish ministry or in other types of ministry to either emerging leaders or to young adults? Say, say that one more time, like it's a little, a little soft. Rites of passages that I have used? Um, it's a little bit hard for me where I am right now because I'm not like in a particular parish with a particular sort of on-growing group of people. Um, so we try to do rites of passage-y sort of stuff though when we do retreats. And so like one, 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 for instance, that we do, which is I think like really powerful for people, is um, as part of like a Be the Bee retreat we'll normally do, we'll teach kids to pray for the first time. So which again is kind of like me, I guess, responding to that need that I saw in, in my life. Um, we'll do a, a retreat with people and we'll kind of spend 20 minutes in silence with them and walk them through the process of knowing how to be aware of their thoughts, knowing how to calm their heart, and then beginning to allow that silence to begin to be filled with prayer. So that hopefully when somebody walks away from this, uh, from this retreat experience, they haven't just heard a presentation on silence, but somebody walked them through step by step how to do it. You know, so that's one example, right? Like picking a particular thing that is part of the life and, and like walking somebody by the hand and showing them how it's done. Um, but if you think of other, other things that I've seen in communities that I visited, for example, right? I went, I went to one community one time which had a uh, food pantry that was part of their like parish ministry. And they, made, they were very, very intentional about having uh, some of their teens and young adults be part of like the committee that actually like stocked it. So if somebody was given the responsibility of like doing this one thing and they realized that the entire ministry like worked because of them, right? That's kind of like this very small moment, like you're being initiated into this larger thing. This thing is not going to work without you, right? These, aren't, like, these don't necessarily need to be complicated things. Um, another example, right, I think you can kind of like think about this as, like a, as, as some sort of like rite of initiation. Even the practice of inviting somebody into the altar, right, which maybe is one of the, the few, few kind of rites of initiation that we still have for people. Right? You think about a, uh, a young boy, 7, 10, whenever kids are normally brought into the altar, like you're given this responsibility, you're given this robe, and expectations are, are made of you. Right? You're kind of brought into this thing, and things won't work in the same way without you being a part of it. Right? We don't think of it that way. I think sometimes we even think about like serving kids in the altar as, I don't know, this status symbol. Right, kind of to Father's point earlier, sometimes we see like the leadership side of things more than the servant side of things, um, as opposed to initiation into something, an initiation into a path, right? A, 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 an important piece uh, in the life of the community, right? Small opportunities, big opportunities. Does that make sense? Thank you very much for that excellent uh, presentation. Uh, after 15 years of myself uh, being a youth ministry leader, I can say that that was an excellent presentation. Um, all cultures that I can think of have rites of passage, bar mitzvahs, quinceaneras, sweet 16, debutantes, even you know, Father Elias and his military experience, the Marines have a rite of passage that makes you a Marine. And these become, they identify you, you were this before, you're this now. Um, we have a rite of passage called baptism, chrismation, and the Holy Eucharist, and that takes place as your picture showed very, very young. So as you're working with the youth, what is that passage leading to? Yes, the forgiven sinner is called to a life of holiness, but 
that young girl after a quinceanera knows what something just happened. That boy or girl becoming a Marine knows something just happened. How do you, what's, what's the passage leading them to? Can you get a little more concrete than that, that they'll know that this just happened? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think this actually becomes maybe a challenge that, that, that we have as Orthodox Christians who are thinking about this today, because there's no, there's no existential change that happens. Like if you've already been baptized and chrismated and received the Eucharist, you know, as a child, right? Like your, your, your ontology has already changed in that moment, right? Like you have already become a new thing. And you've, like I said before, there's no junior Christians. You've already reached the pinnacle. Um, you know, it's not like you weren't a Marine and you become a, a Marine or you were a child and you're becoming an adult, right? Like you're already kind of like there. I think it's, I'm, I'm trying to phrase it for our purposes. Um, especially when we're dealing people who, again, have already entered into the church at a young age, to think about these more from like a ministry point of view and a psychological point of view, that it's these things don't necessarily change who a child is, but they change that child's like awareness of who he is, right? Like as I'm thinking about it, the, um, like the example of bringing like a young boy into the altar, for example, that kid is no more a Christian than he was ahead of time, right? But like he realizes that you are coming into this sacred space and you are being empowered with this particular responsibility um, and you are being called upon to serve in this particular way, right? It's kind of like an emotionally resonant thing. It's a psychologically resonant thing. But even when he stops serving in the altar, he's no le more or less a Christian. Um, so that I think becomes, becomes our challenge to kind of like frame it in terms of what do young people need? What do they need to know? And how can these invitations help them to know that? Right? Because that, that's our challenge. Like a kid is not a kid is not ontologically different when he serves in the altar for the first time or you know joins a ministry board or whatever it might be. Um, so that, that I think becomes our challenge because most of the time rites of initiations are about becoming something different. And like in our in our context, it's more about helping people to young people in particular to understand what's already there, right? Which it takes us a lifetime to actually like unpack and understand. So the goals are a little bit different. Does that make sense? So thank you. Uh, some more questions from the Zoom audience. One question we had is, you know, in, in the someone went in their office, they do uh, quality improvement programs uh, so that they don't repeat the same problems over and over again. Uh, are there things that are preventing us from getting out of the cycle of? taking the kids out of liturgy or these kinds of things, what's preventing us from just improving on these things and, and redirecting our work? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think it's, 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 it's ultimately the, 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 the flaws that we have as a church in terms of our ministry is kind of the limits of our own understanding and imagination. You know, to, to use the example of pulling kids out of, uh, out of Sunday school, I remember having a conversation with my home parish about this at some point, like when I was on the parish council. And it was like this scandalous thing that I suggested that like maybe kids should spend more time in the liturgy. And I was like, Steve, you're some sort of like radical. We've always done it this way, right? So part of it is that. I think part of it is, part of it is like inertia, that sometimes we, 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 we receive things as being like normative when they're not necessarily normative. Um, you know, uh, I think maybe that also like comes to our position as by and large an immigrant church that has like transported forms with us. And when those forms are potentially threatened, like that feels weird to us, even though the form of Sunday school is again, something that we probably inherited from like post World War II Protestant kinds of ministry. A lot of the ways that we do youth ministry is not something that we re received from the fathers. It's what we received from Billy Graham, right? Um, to be a little bit flip about it. Um, so it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's maybe allowing ourselves to, to break out of this narrow sense of like repeating things for the sake of repeating them, right? Not, not focusing on the how and the what, but focusing on the why, which I think sometimes we forget to focus on, right? If the why is Christ, right? If he really is the Alpha and the, and the Omega, and the why is like knowing him, and that's that first and primary need in the life of any person, are we really like helping people know Christ if we keep doing things the way that we had always done and make sure that kids are in liturgy for like 10 minutes at a time? Like if you phrase it that way, I think the answer is no. 
as opposed to the, but we've always done it this way. All right? our, our imagination can be small. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much. It's such an honor for us to be here. And I hope we get a chance to speak with everyone and get to know everyone who's here and who will be coming also in time. Uh, I'm very grateful for this, and I wanted to make a couple comments that are based on ideas and things that I've seen. And one is that, speaking of the bar mitzvah and the bat mitzvah, there actually is a little girl born a cradle Christian and in a Greek Orthodox parish, and around her, all her friends, when she became 13, they were having their bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs, and she said, how come we don't have anything? And she literally made herself a program, a very demanding program. I'm waiting for the answer of reminding what she did. She called it the Theo Mitzvah. <laughs> I want to be her friend. That's great. <laughs> and so she, she learned to chant the Vespers for the eve of the feast day of St. John the Baptist, which was her birthday, close to her birthday. She studied. Uh, for a, uh, with a chanter for three months, meeting once or twice a week. She learned all the tones. She could chant all the resurrection tones. She had to chant all the resurrection tones of uh, the Politikion of, Pas of, of Sunday. Uh, she also, and then her godparents and all the people who were most important in her life, they were all invited. And she had to do this uh, performance and it was mostly practical. It was mostly the chanting and the hymns themselves. It was not a recitation of, of things that she had learned. And she did this and accomplished it. And it was difficult, and it was her Theo Mitzvah. So this is actually possible. <laughs> uh, one thing you mentioned about uh, having a responsibility, having a job, and so on. And your example is bringing boys into the altar. What about the girls? Now, of course, in the monastery, and this is one reason to go to uh, convents, is the girls need to see a fullness of life in which it's the girls. And in the monastery, we do, we have the girls carry the candles. We don't take them into the altar. You mentioned about the forms, and that's right and real. But um, they do carry the candles, and we switch out. On one Sunday, the girls are the ones carrying the candles. The next Sunday, the boys are the ones carrying the candles, following the nun, who is the leader with the candle, and so on. So there are many things like this, but any job, any job, to, it's your job to sweep. It's your job to ring the bell in the great doxology. It's your job to go uh, help wash the dishes afterwards. It's your job to help fix the coffee. And this has just been tremendously important um, for the kids um, about the why and what are we doing. In camp, for instance, we have themes, and one year it was the great feast. And so the way that was needed to teach the older children this um, succession of feasts, what we found ourselves asking was, why do we need this feast? What are we celebrating? So it was, what's the celebration? What's the way of celebrating? What do we need to do in order to actually celebrate this? In other words, the divine liturgy, why all these things? And why? Why? What, what happened? Why is the church celebrating for centuries and making a huge deal or having a fast going up to it, whatever. What's the kernel? What's the meaning? What do I need from this? And for instance, you get to the dormition of the mother of God. Well, why? What do we need? What do we, what's here? And this, the children really dug into, they dig into, and they really, really, really come up with the most amazing uh, things and meanings uh, themselves. Another uh, example is that the, there was a Sunday school class uh, of a church which has wonderful youth things and has things like um, a sleepover at the church where the children fast. This is during Lent, and then they uh, send 
the money that they would have used to eat, they send that to the projects in the parishes in Africa and so on that are needing uh, help and they've drilled wells and they've done all these things. But the children uh, sleep in the church and they learn all these things and they have uh, uh, prosper baking workshops. That these are for the kids and they fill all this 24 hours that they're staying in the church. It's a lockdown in the church uh, with uh, these different practical learnings that they can do. And from this church, one Sunday school class uh, wrote to the monastery asking for a prayer rule and asking what prayer rule can we give the children in the Sunday school class. Um, very, very, what a fantastic request. And then that spread through the entire parish. So the adults also got this prayer rule and they, they have continued it. Um, so these are some of the things, just ideas that come to mind from your very practical and real and just so necessary uh, set of considerations that you put forward. And just to mention that you talked about studying, 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 not learning to do well, something must have taken. <laughs> That's a long story, but yeah. No, thank you, for, thank you for those like really, really important like real world examples, thank you. So thank you for that. Mm. Thank you for that talk. I agree with you absolutely that everyone needs to feel like they are unconditionally loved by their full community to which they belong. Um, I think it often happens in our parishes that there's a narrow range of behaviors and identities that are considered acceptable mm -hmm. in those parishes or in those communities. So how do you teach your child to feel and can, or show or demonstrate or genuinely make sure that your child is unconditionally loved by the full community if the full community does not seem to be accepting of the full range of behaviors and identities that are possible among human beings. So, I mean, how, how, how do we address that? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think in practice, so okay, the, the the model the model that's been helpful for us to sort of understand this in a more foundational way. I'll start there and then and then get to the question, is um, attachment theory, which is something that like psychologists will use to talk about the relationship between a child and his or her caregiver, right? Although it actually like works with all sorts of human relationships. And there's kind of a couple of like key elements as to what that is. But the idea is that when a secure attachment is there, the 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 child in this relationship has the freedom to sort of like learn and explore and make mistakes, but that doesn't undermine the connection with the caregiver, right? So if you think of like, a, like a, a, an example, let's say there's like a baby toddling around in the room, baby looks over his shoulder to see mom, mom is there watching, cool, I'm gonna go like play with toys, I fall and skin my knee, I run over to mom, once I feel safe again, I can go out and explore, right? So this relationship bec becomes this, this, this place of safety, Right? There's this kind of safe harbor, but there's also this springboard that allows the child to go and like explore and so forth. And I think what happens in the lives of a, a lot of young people, especially who maybe like butt up against the church when it comes to like ethical things or stuff that they learn in the wider world, that underlying security was never there, right? And so they hear this thing, right? They feel maybe like potentially like judged or whatever it is by the church and that causes this falling away. You know, because what's, what's the way that we talk about the church? The way that we talk about the church is it's a hospital for sinners, right? And no matter the malady that we have, we should be dealing with that malady here rather than outside, right? But I think sometimes, and this, this is ultimately on us as the adults in the room, right? Because the security of that attachment is not the responsibility of the child. The, res the security of that attachment is the responsibility of the adult, right? If, like, mom is negligent of the kid, it's not the kid's fault, you know? It's mom and dad's fault. Um, they, um, you know, we sometimes when we talk about like success in ministry, like you think about this, right? Like who are the, who are the, the, the good kids that I've ministered to? Like it's always the kids who, be, who behave well, right? Who get the good grades. We kind of implicitly, whether we say it out loud or not, we kind of judge people by their ethical conduct. We judge people by the achievements. And like the bad kids are sort of the failures, which is, which is almost like saying like the failures are all of the sick people in the hospital, you know? 
And that's what we do, unfortunately, right? Because again, that's, that's, that's how our, our, our minds are sort of like trained to work, just given the, given the culture. And so kids who don't fit that model of success, right? The kid who you know, had sex before marriage, the kid who got uh, mixed up in drugs, the kid who's wondering whether he or she is gay, whatever it might be, um, begins to like, see this fundamental incompatibility between who, or he, who he or she is and the church, right? As opposed to like, okay, you're struggling with it, that's fine. We're all struggling with somebody, something and we're gonna struggle with it here. That becomes this sort of like excuse to leave or this feeling of like unwelcomeness to leave. Um, and that becomes the challenge for us because like intention, like this is why pastoring is more of an art than a science, right? How do we cultivate that secure attachment? How do we make people, how do we make people feel welcomed here during all the sort of like non-controversial moments during their lives such that when conflict arises, there's already this, this, this cachet, this kind of like resource of goodwill and connection that we can draw upon in order to deal with a particular conflict, a question of identity, a stumble, whatever it might be, to deal with it here as opposed to, you know, to, to know that like for a, a young person to know that he or she is loved as opposed to a young person imagining that the love that they experience is conditional upon behavior. Right? That's a challenge and it's a lifelong process. And I think, and I think the, the, the problem is like when we get to those crisis moments, we realize that we don't have their resources, that a lot of young people haven't had this lifetime of secure attachment, so this like, thing sort of breaks it. Right, what I'm hearing though from you is that, you know, in part it's, it's rests on the child or the person who feels as though, who, who hasn't been able for whatever reason to build the attachment. What about when they are actually rejected or turned out of the church mm -hmm. by the people in the community because of who they genuinely are. That's, that's more my question. Like how do you deal with a community like that? It's not necessarily the child has a, the child may have built a quite a strong attachment to that community and the community goes, no, we don't want you. Yeah. That's, that's the kind of thing that I'm, I want to know about. Gotcha, I misunderstood, so, so forgive me. That, so that I mean, that's a trauma, right? We have to late rename that for what it is, that's a trauma. Um, that becomes a challenge, right? Because, like, we, have, we had a, a young adult podcast that we used to run, run for a long time, and we would ask young adults like, why they continued to remain connected with the church as they got older, why they fell away. Um, it can be hard, because sometimes it has to be leadership in a particular community who has to sort of be the one that makes the next step, right? At the end of the day, you know, it's what St. Cyril of Alexandria says that you can't have God as your father if you don't have the church as your mother. And the church, in this sense, is all of us, who is the mother of this particular person who feels like this wounded child that has been cast out. And the church has to be the one that goes to like find that lost sheep, right? Maybe it's helpful if individual parishioners do. Maybe it has to be the people who were responsible for that trauma or somebody who can speak on behalf of the community in a more credible way. I don't know, this becomes kind of like a particular thing. Um, but it's, you know, it's mom who has to reach out in that moment, right? And we can all pray and we can hope that a particular's life, like, we also have to approach these things without anxiety, you know, because the story is long. I mean, uh, you think about the, prodig the father of the prodigal son and how prodigally the father loved that son and gave him the space to sort of make his mistakes and was there when he was ready to come back. Like, that's a piece of it too. The story is long and just, somebody, just because somebody is gone today doesn't mean they're gonna be gone tomorrow. Um, but it's a trauma, you know, and somebody needs to, to reach out to heal that trauma, to take that first step. And it's generally not gonna be the kid. Like, I'm curious to hear if your understanding is implemented at a parish level or a diocese level, like what level, and then if it is at the parish level, how we kind of help safeguard against cognitive dissonance that might happen when someone enters another parish that's not having these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, especially like attachment theory, right? Like kind of goes along with that. And then the other thing is like along those same lines, preparing the church to have rights that are safe and also what are negative rites of passage. So an example would be becoming a chanter would be potentially a rite of passage. But there's also the initiation into being a female chanter, which is the first time a male chanter tells you you can't be at the chant stand because you're a temptation. That's a rite of initiation into female chanting. We all have that story, right? So how do we get rid of like those negative rights or, you know what I mean? Like, so there's, 
there is, rights are happening. Um, and I do think there's a certain preparation that has to happen to have rights that feel safe or positive and then carry through to other parishes. And that's like kind of the system piece that I'm curious to hear what you think about and how it gets done because I agree with so much of your presentation and I'm just like wanting to go right into the practical kind of pieces and the, and the pitfalls. So that's totally. No, 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 that was good. And I'm, I'm sorry that you had those negative, those negative rights, right? Um, as, as, a, as a maybe like a foundational sort of matter here when it comes to just the Christian life in general, um, we're never going to get rid of the negative, right? And I'm not sure at the end of the day how helpful it, it, it is for us to even like fight against the ne negative as an, as, a, as an abstract rule. I mean, we, we can think of it particular exceptions, things that need to be addressed. But it's, you know, St. Porfirios, um, uh, it's, it's quoted in Wounded by Love. He has this image, like, if you have a room that is dark, right, the lights have been switched off, all of the shutters have been drawn, it's pitch black, I can't give you a shovel and ask you to sort of remove the darkness from that room. You just have to let in a little bit of light, right? And the tiny little shaft of light, light begins to transform it. And our task as Christians is to continue to double down on what is healthy, right? Like that's how you, that's how you would address unhealth at the end of the day, right? You kind of create conditions for, for health. Um, you, don't, you don't necessarily get rid of the negative by going after the negative. You allow the positive to flood it out, right? So the more, the more like, positive rites of initiation, the more positive interactions that we can cultivate, when the negative ones inevitably do happen, it's kind of that, that, that store of resilience that I was talking about before. These can be more of like an exception to the general, like the, the rhythm of life in a community that isn't going to have the same level of shock, right? If you're surrounded by all these positive examples and then here's this one bad thing that happens, like, okay, that's an aberration. I'm not gonna say that it's not bad, but maybe it's not gonna shake us in the same way if we have this cushion of other, you know, overwhelming like good examples to sort of follow back on. Does that make sense? Because um, again, human, like the, the downside of the church being a hospital is that we're all sick and we're all doing negative things to each other all the time. Um, and there's no way of getting around that. Um, but that model, just that sort of like that basic model of attachment, I mean, it exists, it exists everywhere. Um, it, it's just kind of a basic, I think, a, a helpful model of like human interactions, both pastoral, familial, whatever it is. Um, how do you avoid cognitive dissonance? between parishes and stuff, that's a huge problem as well. Like, if anything, right, it's one of, the, one of the things that has become apparent during the course of the last year and a half in particular is the way that we are, you know, there's that phrase cafeteria Catholics, like people love to beg and choose. Like, we're all cafeteria Orthodox too. And over the last year and a half, we have like jumped to different parishes because they suit us and our particular politics and whatever it is, right? Like when it suits us, we, we disobey our bishops. When it suits us, we whatever. Um, so that cognitive dissonance is like the lay of the land right now because we still don't know what the heck it is to be a church. We're a bunch of groups who are like pretending to be the church sometimes. We still haven't figured that out. But when the church actually comes to these shores, it'll be a glorious thing. Um, <laughs> So I don't know. I don't know. Pray. I don't know. Sorry, that was like harsh. <laughs> we probably be, want to be mindful of giving everybody a, a stretch break. We've got coffee out here. Restrooms are in the back. Thank you, Stephen, for this excellent presentation.